Welcome to the Disruptive Social Care Podcast with social care provocateur and social media queen Shirley Ayres and myself, Stuart Arnott, founder of Mindings, a service dedicated to bringing social media to the disconnected. In this fortnightly show, we aim to spread the word about what's going on in the world of disruptive social care, amplify the voices of people with great ideas that few people have ever heard about, and to help our communities connect and collaborate. Today, we're welcoming Andrea Sutcliffe, Chief Executive of the Social Care Institute for Excellence, who's our guest today. Hello, Andrea. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Welcome to our little conspiratorial den. (laughs) (laughs) So hello there, Shirley. Show number six. Indeed. And a milestone for us, Stu. Over 400 views of the webcam of our podcast. And a lovely description of the podcast from Mobile Social Work, who describes it as professional development for social care in a user-friendly format. Well, that's, uh, that's really nice. Uh, I get quite a few tweets from people saying that they listen to it on their way to work. Quite a few people saying that they, they listen to it in a car. So I hope you're paying attention to driving, but because I'm now <laughs> feeling like a drive time DJ. So my advice, Chris Evans, if you want more listeners, talk about social care. <laughs> Shirley, what's been happening this week in the world of social care? Well, it's a fascinating debate about um, whether technology and social media is helping or preventing our ability to engage in face-to-face human interactions. And in discussing with many people how digital technology and networks can support new models of care for older people, one of the major concerns that people have is that they will lose the human contact which is so important to us all. So I was really interested to read about the adventures of Craigslist Joe. Great story. An American who spent a month finding out if online communities can take care of people in real life. Mm-hmm. And Joseph Garner, he's made a documentary, Craigslist Joe, which follows him as he tries to find out if personal connections and friendships exist outside of our computers, phones and the internet. And surprisingly, they do. (laughs) And he used Craigslist, which is a free listing site, to find opportunities to travel across America, volunteer, meet new people, eat and make money and find places to sleep. Soon to be released in the UK, I really look forward to seeing it because it's a demonstrable evidence that people can take online connections offline and it's creating new communities. Really exciting. I even heard that the cameraman came from Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this actually you know, prompted a Twitter discussion with online, about online connections, communication and trust <clears throat> with a great quote, I have to say, from Craigslist, Joe. You have to connect with people in some way first if you want them to trust you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so following on from that, a great post by Patrick Butler um, from The Guardian, uh, which talks about how disability activists are using social media to put care cuts on the political agenda. And this discusses the success of the Twitter-driven approach to campaigning, which has engaged so many campaigners who are confined to their homes. You know, and the the Spartacus report, there's some really, really good examples of how people are making their voices heard through social media. So that's actually one of the reasons why I'm so keen that we promote it, because it's important lessons for us all, and especially for social care, you know, about about how we engage people who use our services. Absolutely. And I was interested to see um, a free leadership course for people based in London who are active in the disability movement. Uh, Inclusion London's free pilot leadership course, Understanding Leadership in the Disability Movement, um, starts in September, one masterclass a month for deaf and disabled people who are involved in this in the disability user-led organisation movement um, and who wish to expand their leadership skills and knowledge. So, I mean, a great, great initiative. So well done to Inclusion London. Good on them. So you'll find it links to all of these... Um, things on our extensive show notes. But, you know, we're, we are covering such a big area <clears throat> in our disruptive social care. And once again, I repeat the need we all have to redefine social care. 
uh, much differently from how it is. It is more than residential care. It is more than home care. And that's what we're trying to do. So on that basis, what have you been up to, Stuart? Well, we've had a re- brilliant week doing what my mindings partner Ian calls building a shiny thing, which is uh, something that we sometimes do just to avoid doing real work. Uh, but this time it was <laughs> properly justified because um, we've always known that the calendar that mindings has was a bit basic. Um, and the concept was always that it, it should be something that you could add entries to from your mobile phone. Um, you know, with a, cal- a calendaring program that you use, like iCal or Calendar or Google Calendar, etc., and not our proprietary calendar that you have to visit our website to use. So a couple of weeks ago, we are having a Skype chat with one of our beta testers, Susan, um, whose mum is living with Alzheimer's, and uh, we learned something that we hadn't realised. Um, I'd built the original calendar for me, as you know, to, to populate it with birthdays and appointments, etc., um, for my dad. But Susan said that the real- reality was that... Um, with someone living with dementia or someone who's dependent on receiving care, more likely they would have several people um, who were helping look after them. So a multi-user shared calendar uh, was something that, that would be needed. So we decided not to put it off any longer. And over the last fortnight, um, I locked Ian in a dark room and uh, he's built this <laughs> amazing and powerful multi-user shared calendar um, and a beautiful new clean and intuitive display. And I'm, I'm just really, really proud of it. it. It takes mindings to the next level, away from just photos and messaging and social media into something that I really believe can help with assisted living. Um, it's something that, you know, I, I think needs a category of its own, consumer telecare or social telecare, as I like to call it. You know, as I think I've said before, this kind of irony that I can go to Argos and buy a burglar alarm, I can go to Boots and buy a blood pressure meter, I can go to Mother Care and buy a baby alarm. Where can I go to buy some... Um, tools, equipment, services that help me look after my family. That's something that's only really been the purview of um, of uh, local authorities. This is something that I think that families should say, well, this is we could do this, and that's that's what mine is all about. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to challenge the listeners. Uh, we put a lot of work into this show, and Minding sponsors it. So, and we hope that the listeners get good, good get good value of the show. So, I'm going to ask a little favour of everybody. After the show, I want you to go to mindings.com. And check out what Mindings is. If you think Mindings is the thing that will help you get better connected to your family, sign up for a free account and get a month's free trial and try it out. Um, And if you think that Mindings could be just the thing for a friend or for a charity or a care home or a a community that you're involved in, then take a minute, email them our URL, encourage them to check us out. Um, You know, we've poured our hearts and souls into this for a couple of years now. Our beta testers think that minding is the best thing since sliced bread. So uh, go on the website, check out the toast testimonials, um, because we just want people to be using it now. And I fully support that. And I like the idea of social telecare, because very few people understand what telecare is, to be honest. So we're setting up a new category. And I think what I'd like to see is mindings being used by sheltered housing. Um, units. I think it's got so many applications. So we're putting a new category called social telecare, of which Mindings is a really excellent example. So I would also I'd encourage people, as Stuart says, go and have a look. Because especially, I was thinking this the other day, I mean, my, my granddaughter starts school in September, and everybody wants a photo of her in her new school uniform. And Mindings would be ideal. You know, you take the photo, upload it to Mindings, and everybody right across the world could see granddaughter in new school uniform. So, you know, start of the school term, you want your parents who live away from you to see what's going on with the family, try Mindings for a month. Thank you, Shirley. It's a nice endorsement. <laughs> and it's, it's actually a good point because um, th- this kind of social uh, and technical disconnect that, 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 that people do have, um, I... Uh, spoke to somebody the other week and they were offended because they hadn't been invited to a party and their friend had said but I put it on Facebook <laughs> not everybody's on Facebook and you know and I think sometimes people forget these, these little stories as you know as you know you see them I put little funny things my daughter says or pictures of the party and, and I think I think sometimes that uh, they, they forget that the grandparents and various other people aren't on there just because they put them into Facebook etc yes. so mine yes. helps with that so that's my plug for this week Mindings.com, check it out, give it a try. And uh, and I think the other thing I'd say, the reality is that normally someone who's receiving care from a local authority will have about 10 people involved, you know, from my own experience with my parents and, and with other relatives. And it is a nightmare keeping 
you know, contact with all of these different, you know, across health, across social care, might be private providers, there might be volunteers. So I think having a multi-use calendar is a really great addition. Uh, very necessary because there's often either overlap or there are gaps. And that's really not very good if you've got a vulnerable person at home relying on people coming in to provide their care. I look forward to hearing people using it. Yes, indeed. Andrea Sutcliffe is the Chief Executive of the Social Care Institute for Excellence and is passionate about making a difference. Although not a social worker, her professional training was in NHS finance. She has been at the interface of health and social care for most of her career. Andrea is a keen cycling fan and she recently wrote a lovely post about what social care can learn from Bradley Wiggins and Team Sky. Go away, go. (laughs) (laughs) Sky was set up a decade ago to promote high-quality social care for children and adults. It has pioneered digital training for anyone working in the social care field and its social care TV has videos on topics as varied as safeguarding adults and commissioning for personalisation. And one of my particular favourites is the very easy to understand rough guide to personalisation, which I have frequently recommended should be given to everyone involved in social care. So, Andrea, just to start the conversation on this one, a lot of people seem to be confused about the overlap between Sky and NICE. Could you explain the differences between the two organisations? Certainly. Um, uh, NICE is the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, as I'm sure you can imagine it does what it says on the tin and is focused um, on uh, improving uh, services um, in health and it also produces public health guidance. And you might kind of say that Sky is a sister organisation to NICE but for social care. So as you quite rightly say, what we're here for is to improve the experience of those people who are using um, social care services um, by sharing the knowledge of what works and doing that in lots of different ways so producing reports guidance but as you quite rightly point out and thanks for the plug um, (laughs) the social care tv and our other digital um, and online products um, to to help i mean i think that um Any confusion that exists maybe arises as a consequence of the Health and Social Care Act, um, uh, which this year um, uh, gave a nice responsibility um, for developing social care guidance. And they will indeed be changing their name. They'll still be nice, but the C will turn into care rather than clinical. Um, And um, what they're going to do is to set up a collaborating centre to deliver the, the development of that guidance. So Sky will be... Um, hoping to win the contract um, to um, deliver uh, the Collaborating Centre for Social Care and um, we're looking forward to that process starting off sometime in September and I am confident but obviously not complacent um, that we will be (laughs) successful um, because we think that that's something that we really, really want to do. But I think the other thing to say is you're right, it is an overlap. You know, NICE does all sorts of things, mm-hmm. um, um, has a really broad range of responsibilities mm-hmm. and does them extremely, extremely well. Um, I would say I declare an interest because I was the Deputy Chief Executive of NICE before, um, uh, up until 2007. <laughs> um, so, um, so I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but I think that it's for Sky, the collaborating centre of social care guidance wouldn't be the only thing that we'd be doing as well. I want to see us as a a vibrant and dynamic organisation supporting improvement in social care in a variety of different ways and moving things forward um, from that point of view. Mm, interesting. A new collaboration centre. We'll watch the space. Absolutely. <laughs> and of course, Sky's funding from the Department of Health has fallen from more than 20 million in 2009 10 to just 4.4 million this year. Now, I read that Find Me Good Care, a website launching this year to help people make decisions about care and support, is key to Sky's financial health. And just thinking, with over 30 care comparison websites, 
How will Sky be competing in what is an increasingly crowded marketplace? I mean, I think the first thing to say about the funding is to be clear that our funding has always fluctuated depending upon the specific projects um, that we have been uh, commissioned to to deliver. So in the particular year that you um, uh, referred to, we were actually, you know, a, a significant amount of that funding actually related to a time-limited project. Um, so, um, uh, so, so that kind of accounts for the very significant difference, but you're absolutely right. Like, any other organisation, we have been seeing a reduction in our income um, over recent years. And what we need to do to make sure that we're sustainable going forward is to actually seek income from different sources. Um, but we're not a commercial organisation. You know, that's we we maybe need to be more business minded about what we do. But we're we're, we're not a we're not a private sector organisation. Um, and what's more important about Find Me Good Care is that actually we're developing a service which is about providing people with information, good quality information, um, to guide them through the complex and confusing world that exists when they're considering care options, either for themselves or for their family members. So Find Me Could Care is not just a comparison website. Um, of that is part of it, obviously, but it's going to be built around um, a core content of advice and guidance um, to help people navigate through those different options. And what we will be doing is encouraging people to think about what's important to them and then what are the services that actually might be able to assist them in achieving whatever outcome um, uh, they're, they're setting for themselves. So it's not just, I've got a postcode, put that in and I'll find out what the residential homes are locally. It's it's And what we're hoping is that there'll be a more dynamic way of people looking at what they're doing. And we hope that the um, the reputation that Sky has, you know, which I think, again, I would say this, wouldn't I? Um, but uh, <laughs> is is a good reputation for, um, you know, providing um, uh, uh, quality um, uh, information, the rigour of the work that we do, the connections that we've made, you know, the, the network that we have with the plethora of, of social care organisations, both providers, local authorities, other national organisations. We're hoping that we can build upon all of that to actually bring something that's very valuable to the people who matter, who are the folk who are actually using social care services. Because I certainly think one of the challenges is that often families don't think about care until they're in crisis. Absolutely. And I think that um, the one of the other things that we, we also need to be thinking about is that families no longer just live down the road either. Yeah. Um, we are very diffuse. Um, my parents live in North Yorkshire. Um, I'm the only uh, uh, child that's left in this country, my brother and sister in Hong Kong, um, but I'm 200 and odd miles away. If something happened to my father and I needed to think about what I did for my mum, um, then, you know... Where would I go? I, I, and I, I'm somebody who knows their way around the system a wee bit. Um, so actually thinking about the different ways that people will be accessing information um, and making sure that that, uh, that information um, doesn't force them into a corner in terms of, you know, well, there is only one option. Uh, um, you know, the, the, there are a variety of different options which are right for people at different stages. Um, and we need to make sure that folk have control and informed choice. And of course, digital technology is creating even more options. So it's interesting to think about the Get Connected project, yes. which Sky managed, which enabled thousands of service users, carers and staff to have better access to digital technology. But what happens now? I mean, there are about 2,000 um, care providers that were supported through that. I mean, obviously, Care Quality Commission have got about 21,000 um, registered. So are there plans for further initiatives or support for care providers to become more connected? I mean... Get Connected was a brilliant project for us to be involved in. Um, and we have some fabulous stories um, of the way that we have been able to support people to use technology. I mean, there's a fantastic story um, uh, from last year where um, uh, an elderly lady in a home um, in the northwest was able to um, uh, to be a part of a family wedding down on the south coast. Um, and and it's, just, it's just fantastic. You know, and the home kind of did an 
an awful lot to support that, but you know what made it work was the fact that the technology was yeah. there to support that experience, um, which I just think is lovely. Um, what we've been doing. <clears throat> around this now is is um, uh, looking at the, re- the the research findings and actually sort of really making that case. And I think that what we've been able to demonstrate with Get Connected is that technology can indeed make a difference. Mm-hmm. So we're developing some tools that will support people um, in the future, um, you know, so um, identifying those benefits, what they need to do, how they need to go about it, what works, what what kind of pitfalls there might be that they want to sort of uh, think about as they're moving forward. Um, so so we're really, we're in the sort of propagating the gospel sa- um, stage of, of all of this now and actually encouraging um, uh, care providers and communities to take advantage of the uh, opportunities that technology offers to us. Well, when I wrote a post about should all care homes be providing internet access to residents, this certainly provoked a lot of responses. Mm, I'm sure it did. And what did people say? <laughs> I, I, I think it was a mix um, of some organisations saying there's no demand at the moment uh, and when there is, we'll provide it. And other people absolutely astounded that internet access wasn't the norm mm. in every home in the country. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we've got to think about from um, a social care perspective is, um, you know, we're not, it's not just older people. Um, uh, there's a whole spectrum of folk who are, are using services that we need to be thinking out about supporting. And they are definitely, you know, inter, uh, uh, technology savvy. And also the up and coming generation of older people who will be accessing services, you know, have got you know me as their daughter and my my niece as, as their grandchild, kind of you know encouraging them to use um, uh, different types of technology, and they are going to expect it. Um, and we need to be thinking about that definitely. My dad, you know, spends half half a day on <laughs> on, on 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 the computer and actually goes around his local village supporting other people to do that as well. Um, and, and, and I know from his experience that there definitely is um, a, a demand for it. Well, this, uh, yeah, I, it, it, this, this debate will continue and continue <laughs> because, of course, attitudes towards technology are beginning to change, um, especially amongst service users and carers. And, and, of course, this is the Disruptive Social Care podcast. So, so what do you think that disruptive technology can contribute to social care? Well, I think that... <sighs> One of the problems is that people get worried with disruptive technology as a, as, as a terminology. I mean, they think it's maybe risky, um, something that we should be avoiding to keep the peace. Um, but I think that, you know, there's so much that we take for granted um, at the moment, um, you know, out in the, the wider world that was considered disruptive when it first came in. You know, plastic, for example digital photography. Um, So I think from a social care perspective, we need to make sure that we're not lagging behind um, Mm -hmm. and that we take advantage of those things. Um, And uh, Sky did some uh, um, social care TV films last year looking specifically at telecare and assistive technologies. And, And some of them were really very simple. Some of them were quite sophisticated. But the common themes that came through from people were they appreciated um, the ability to have support in different ways. Um, it was giving people back confidence. Um, it was, um, it, one gentleman kind of said, you know, this is helping to maintain my sanity. Um, and, and and I think that what it did was, um, what we were able to do was to highlight um, that actually it could make a very positive um, uh, difference for people. Now, one of the reasons, and it maybe goes back to that little bit that you were talking about, Shirley, in terms of um, people not necessarily thinking that internet access was the the thing to be doing, um, is that you know people worry about um, technology um, taking the place of personal relationships, um, and that you know we'll think that we can do everything you know, in in a technical way, and um, and I think that um, from a social care perspective, we are never ever going to lose the importance importance of those sure. um, personal relationships. And what some of the stories in our films demonstrated was actually that they enhanced and benefited those personal relationships. There's one gentleman, Jonathan, who said, you know, actually what this is ena- enabling is for um, the technology to, to do the mundane tasks mm. um, and for me, therefore, to suspend, you know, to actually not 
feel so guilty about asking carers to do certain things, mm. which I thought was great, you know, and actually means that he's able to spend his life doing, you know, things that are much more fruitful um, uh, uh, in terms of improving his quality of life. Unlike many of our colleagues in health, the voluntary sector, police and housing, social care sector has been very slow to understand the opportunities provided by social media to improve services and engage people in a different way. So as one of the few senior tweeting chief executives, do you have any top tips to encourage senior managers to use social media? Well, I would say... Come on in, the water's lovely. Um, and and I'd say I'd say that for three key reasons. The first is the ability um, for me to communicate and connect um, with people in the social care um, uh, sector to highlight the important work that um, Sky does, which helps us to promote that work, but also to get feedback. So, for example, we launched um, a new website earlier this year called Info for Care Kids, and I tweeted about it, and um, uh, and we got some some few people picked that up, and two things happened. First off, we got pretty much immediate recognition in the Google searching, which was great. Um, and secondly, we got lots of comments. Uh, and some of those were, were very positive and very welcoming of it. But some gave us some really useful tips about what we could do to improve that site. So it was fantastic and it was really pretty immediate in terms of getting that feedback, which, you know, surveys and things would take an awful lot of yep. time to do. The second thing, I think, is that it shows that I'm a real person. You know, that um, I love my job um, and people can see that, but they also know that um, I'm just as enthusiastic about sport, music, the theatre, all of those kind of things. And I think it sort of makes things more real. Um, so you mentioned the, the uh, Bradley Wiggins post. And, and I was able to do that because everybody knew that I'd been following the Tour de France and that I was really into it and I was really chuffed that Bradley had won and all of that kind of thing. And so what I wrote was therefore not a corporate, you know, let's take advantage of this, um, sure. was actually something that was very real and made a connection. And the third key benefit, I would say, is the connection with my staff. Um, uh, n partly to encourage them to tweet because they've got some great stories to tell and the specific pieces of work that they're doing, but also to create a sense of common purpose um, and shared interest um, between their chief executive um, and mm. themselves. And so people talk to me about the things that I tweet about, be that work, be that um, the things that I'm doing in my personal life. And I think that that does actually create a much stronger bond and trust um, between senior leaders and staff, which in challenging times, is absolutely invaluable. Um, I think a lot of people, um, uh, particularly senior management, are thinking, oh my goodness, this is another chunk of time I'm somehow going to have to find. It's bad enough that I've got a Blackberry where people can <laughs> contact me, you know, morning, noon and night. Um, how on earth am I meant to cope with the great unwashed now being able to tweet me and I, I am expected to respond to them all? So how practically do you deal with um, making yourself available and responding and making time in order to, to direct, you know, in a way that nobody has ever been able to communicate with chief executives before or anyone in How do you manage that? I mean, I do have to say that that is an issue. Um, and it's you, you can get not just in terms of the direct connection, but you can get so easily distracted into um, the up-team posts that Shirley makes um, and, uh, uh, and Ermin True too, who should get an honourable mention here. I mean, I could spend right. all day looking at all <laughs> of the things that you guys recommend that I should be, I should be reading. So I think you have to be disciplined um, and you yeah. have to kind of actually um, uh, see, see it as something that's part and parcel of the work that you're doing. Um, uh, and when the little blue um, bird tweets up um, and says you've got to mention, you know, do take a look but actually don't be thinking that you have to do it immediately because you're in the middle of a meeting because actually you, you know, that's, it's, it's that's what you need to be concentrating on at that time, and and I would I, I wouldn't make any better recommendation um, to people than to read the list of tips that Lisa Rodriguez, which I know that you mm -hmm. highlighted last week, um, uh, put out um, on the Health Service Journal um, uh, website. Which were I mean, Lisa is a chief executive of Mental Health Trust, but I think that her tips around how to manage all of this were invaluable. So um, Lisa yes. says this. Um, yes. um, everybody yes. have a look. 
Yes. We'll look per link to that in show notes. Well, we, we mentioned Again. it last week and we'll repeat it this week. So, um, as, as you're aware, we, we did invite people to um, ask questions um, for today's podcast. And one of the issues that came up amongst practitioners was how the Social Care Institute for Excellence is encouraging frontline practitioners um, to research um, and how Sky is looking at priority areas and and could we develop a similar scheme to Nurse First, which you know, I'm really interested in because it's an innovation and leadership program for community professionals, which is supporting practitioners to create innovative ideas and to help get the funding to make them a reality um, and to implement the challenges in their organisation. So how is Sky supporting practitioners with research and determining what the priorities are for Sky? I mean, Sky has long argued um, that research at a practitioner level is important. I mean, there's a, a report on our website from 2005 that says something yep. just like that. So, <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, it's not new to us. Um, and, you know, what's really great is that the um, professional capabilities framework for social workers includes in the domain around professional leadership and um, involvement in research as, as a key thing to be doing. So there's there's kind of, you know, it's 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 sort of one of those things that I think everybody would be, agree is a good thing um, and so it's great to have had the question. The difficulty is that Sky doesn't necessarily have the remit nor indeed the funds to kind of kickstart research um, at a practitioner uh, 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 level and we do do try and do what we can, particularly around the Social Care Research Ethics Committee, which we support, to advise practitioners on research when they're coming to us in terms of how do you get um, ethics uh, approval and that kind of thing. Um, but specifically on Nurses First, because um, very kindly you told me about this beforehand, so I had a look at their website. Um, and if you look at the process um, for application, it actually says, and I quote, you do not need to be a nurse. Um, and you should you could be a physiotherapist, dietitian, pharmacist, a social worker, GP or any other uh, care professional. So actually, um, I think that that opens up uh, opportunities for social workers, perhaps the person who asked the question, um, to apply and, and give it a go um, because they're obviously welcoming that despite the fact that it's called Nurse First. Um, but should we have something specifically for social workers? I think that's a really interesting idea and the place that I'd suggest that we take that to is the new chief social worker um, who is going to be be appointed imminently I understand and I think that it might be a really interesting challenge to pose to him or her um, when they come into post I, which we'd be happy to help with as well obviously. I, th I think that's a very very good idea because I, I, one of the things that interests me about Nurse First is where their money comes from because it's a real sort of mix of research is, organisations, yes. um, private funders mm -hmm. and so I think if we can get lots of people behind it this could be really good for, for social work and social care practitioner research because that is, that is a concern. There are people out there doing a lot of good work, but there's a disconnect. So yeah. I think we must continue to work on this. That sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you have any sort of final thoughts about the, 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 the biggest challenges we face in making social care fit for the 21st century? I mean... <sighs> What I'd say is that when I um, was applying for this job and then coming into the role, what I have been struck by is the um, diversity of the challenges that we have. Um, so, um, you know, we've got the funding, we've got increased expectations, we've got the complexity of, of needs, the different um, groups that we're providing support to, um, the different um, organisations and the provider landscape. The I mean, you know, you name it, we've got it um, yep. uh, in, in terms of social care. But above all, I think that there's a need for us to support people using social care, to have a good experience, um, to be treated with dignity and respect and to achieve the outcomes that they want. Um, so I'd say, actually, that the biggest challenge um, is for us not to lose sight of that goal. Um, and not to get weighed down by the pressures and that complexity um, and to resort to a council of despair, um, but to concentrate um, on what we can do to improve things um, for individuals because, after all, it's them that only matter and that's yes. what we're here for. Yes. 
And they are all of us. Indeed, absolutely. <laughs> Any one of us. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us, Andrea. It's and been my pleasure. I hope you can stay around and, and contribute um, to the rest of the programme. I'm here for you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we'll also be asking you for a couple of Follow Friday recommendations. You have, of course, already mentioned Ermitrude too. Yes, indeed. Who is one of our favourites, but you may have some others that I've you would like to got share. a few up my sleeve. <laughs> I'd refer to Ermitrude too as one of our alumni, because I kind of feel that she's sitting here next to us. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I, I like this. Our, our alumni. Yes. That's what it is. It's one of my full of faders. You're now, you're now, you're now joining alumni. the alumni. <laughs> I feel very privileged. <laughs> this section of the programme is called Follow Friday because it's Friday that we release the show, but also because people who use Twitter use hashtag FF for Follow Friday to recommend people to their community. Shirley, who have you got for us this week? Um, firstly, I'd just like to share... Uh, some of my favourite social media quotes of the week. Andrea's already mentioned about sort of social media and connections with people and Twitter keeps me sane. There was a comment from a carer whose parent has Alzheimer's. With such powerful networks using social media, I'm able to be supported, connected, share experiences and actually just talk online. And a reminder from at Kim Gost the etiquette of social media, to read replies, respond and engage to build relationships. It is called social media for a reason. <laughs> I saw that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and something that was highlighted by um, at Paul Bromford. One good tweet from a CEO is worth more than 100 tweets from other staff. Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, provokes some comment mm. because of the feeling that this implied staff are not valued. But, I mean, for me, and I certainly think, you know, Andrea's use of, uh, of social media is, um, is, is testimony to this. It highlights the importance of the leadership role in having an online presence. It really does make a difference. And I think that what came out of that debate that happened was um, that actually we weren't saying, you know, it wasn't being said that uh, you know, it, the, the chief exec's tweets were better than anybody else's. It was actually yeah. the leadership of the chief yes. executive and encouraging other people to do it, which I think is you know, one of the, the positive benefits. Absolutely, yes. And um, and and a lovely, well, rather philosophical quote, but, uh, you know, we are co-curators of our past, co-participants in our present and co-designers of our future. Thank you, McGendy M. That's a bit deep for you this week, shall we? <laughs> well, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> I think, but I, I suppose the reality is that... Um, digital technology and social media is more likely to make that happen than at any other time in our lives, making a reality of it. We were last time talking about innovations in giving and the fact that there are so many opportunities, but how people access them is, um, is still a bit of a challenge. Um, so I'd like to mention Friends of the Elderly who support and enhance the quality of life for older people. And they're always looking for volunteers. So if you fancy home visiting or telephone befriending, do get in touch with at Friends of the Elderly. Ivo UK is a social network, once again connecting peoples and, people and organisations who want to change their worlds. And they provide simple-to-use tools to enable people to share their passions for change in their communities. And they've got a national listing of volunteers willing to give their time, plus video listings of volunteer opportunities and events. So, um, so these are a few of the hundreds of organisations who would like volunteers who are all available online. And um, help from home, I, I smiled at because it provides free information on easy, um, no-commitment, home-based micro-volunteering opportunities that can be performed in just your pyjamas. Or oh, did they suggest pyjamas or did oh, yes. you suggest the pyjamas? No, I, I took this from their website. You <laughs> can perform this in your pyjamas. <laughs> the mind boggles. <laughs> I'm sure you can do another clothing if you want. <laughs> so that's help from home. So we'll, we'll put up the links. Um, I'm often asked um, about the people who've influenced my use of social media. So I thought I would share some of my social media wise owls. And I'd like to start with at Ewan. Um, and Ewan Semple helps people understand the web and is the author of my recommended book of the year. Organisations don't tweet, people do. 
Uh, <laughs> lovely guy. Met him, have heard him talk on a number of occasions. I think that would be my sort of number one book that everyone should have. And, and he knows that um, I, I, I have a personally signed copy from Ewan <laughs> of his book. Um, secondly, at Mark Schaefer, um, Mark describes himself as a social media bouncer. Ooh. Yes. Uh, university lecturer, innovator and author of Return on Influence and The Tao of Twitter. Once again, both very good books to read. And at Brian Solis, uh, internationally renowned digital analyst, sociologist and futurist and author of The End of Business as Usual which explores the complex consumer revolution which is changing the future of business, media and culture. I love uh, that book. It's a great book. It, it is. And engage. I mean, once again, I, I, I had the fortune to, um, to meet Brian last year and we had some fascinating discussions about, you know, is, is social care in the consumer market? Hmm, how can we how can we look at what needs to change? Um, and as Brian says, when you engage, you build an authoritative social network which increases your visibility, relevance, and influence. So, real lessons for social care there. Now, Eric Kalman is the creator of the fabulous social media revolution video, which made me really aware of the power of social media. And as Eric says, it's not a question about whether you should do social media, but how well you do it. And he's the author of Socialnomics, How Social Media Transforms the Way We Live and Do Business. Once again, um, for me, a fairly key book worth reading. And finally, Neil Schaefer. Neil is a social media strategy consultant and author of Maximizing LinkedIn for Sales and Social Media Marketing. Um, one of my real experts on using LinkedIn effectively and a thoroughly recommended and a really nice guy. So those are my, my the start of my social media influences. <laughs> Andrea, do you have any follow well, I'm sure, um, given that we're at uh, episode six of your podcast, you've probably already recommended some of the people that I would uh, highlight. But um, uh, I'll put in a plug for at Sky uh, Social Care um, because it's a really good way for people to pick up the new material that's coming onto our site. Um, and we've got some uh, really interesting stuff coming up in the autumn around avoiding hospital admissions, end of life care, some safeguarding work. Um, so you know, uh, keep keep tabs. On, uh, on Sky um, to, to find all of that out. Um, the, t the people who I look for uh, on my on my timeline, um, obviously your good self, Shirley, um, uh, but um, uh, Richard Humphreys um, at the King's Fund, um, who is a very wise commentator on all things yes. social care um, and an all round good guy. Um, Jill Phillips at Whose Shoes, um, and particularly for um, her powerful dementia blogs, um, which um, she's been publishing um, over the last um, few months, um, which introduced me to um, Norman McNamara um, who has dementia and uh, Susie Webster um, whose mother um, and grandmother have had dementia um, and I think that you know that, that again there's a really powerful um, set of connections developing there and I'm looking forward to meeting Jill um, in the very um, uh, near future um, and finally I would recommend all of the Think Local Act Personal team um, who um, are, are all avid tweeters particularly Martin Routledge um, um, but Jamie Lewis, um, Shahana Ramsden, um, uh, all tweet as well. So they are definitely worth a follow. Thank you. And um, we'll add them to the list. Absolutely. Let's we'll put some it. notes on to there. Um, you mentioned LinkedIn, uh, Shirley. So I'll just mention um, Lewis Howes, um, who is pretty much the king of um, making LinkedIn work for you for sales. Uh, I've watched a couple of um, uh, webinars that he's done. And he does some really good in an hour. And he basically says, do this now. Do it with me while I'm talking you through it. And you just suddenly find your LinkedIn rankings just go through the roof. Very good. Um, he also does some work with Laura Roder, who's another social media um, expert who does some really good um, uh, work on Twitter and on Facebook as well. So I'll give a shout out to them. And finally, um, I'd like to give a shout out to Hashbang TV. Um, it's a fun video and audio podcast profiling some of the UK's leading entrepreneurs and uh, tech community personalities. It's a kind of a chat down the pub kind of style, not strictly social care, but if you're an entrepreneur 
uh, and you're out there creating new apps or services. It's a fun show and you will learn stuff because it's presented by a couple of tech entrepreneurs, Chris Book of Bardell, who we mentioned in a previous show, and James Parton of Twilio, who've been there and they've done it. So uh, we'll put all these details and other information about things we're talking about onto the show notes on the website, which again is disruptorsocialcare.com and on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash disruptorsocialcare. So come and follow us. So Shirley, what do we have coming up in the next few weeks? Well, personally, um, I've been having a lovely time with my grandson, who who is actually in the studio today watching the podcast. (laughs) And... um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and a personal shout out to my daughter, who has recently qualified as a nurse. I am a very proud mum. Congratulations. <laughs> well done. Um, but uh, coming on to a, some things that are the, that are sort of on the horizon at the moment, we have a new innovation in giving Ageing World Challenge from Nesta, which is inviting applications for innovative ideas to address isolation and older people. As we've discussed previously, I mean, isolation and loneliness, well, they're they're not just concerns for older people. They are concerns for society as a whole. But because they can affect older people's physical and emotional health, it's something that we have to take, obviously, quite seriously. So there, there there are huge opportunities to drive more creative, inclusive and innovative solutions which improve older people's lives. And I think what is really critical is the involvement of older people at all levels of planning and delivery, which I think will go some way to developing suitable products and services which meet the expectations of the baby boomer generation, um, which requires challenging the stereotypes, assumptions and derogatory comments about older people and a big rethink from marketers. I've noticed that the Knitting Grannies <laughs> advert, which you know I absolutely hate, has made a reappearance. Has it? I, is it back on television again? Oh, no. Oh, Andrea, she doesn't like the oh, Knitting dear. Grannies. <laughs> well, I think, you know, what, what really strikes me about all of this is that there is, a, there is a major disconnect between how marketers think they should be selling to older people this huge demographic, 50 plus up to, you know, 100, 110, and their assumptions that we all, you know, are a particular, we, we all have a sort of particular lifestyle or that, you know, we all want to be portrayed as knitting grannies. <laughs> I think as Andrea was saying earlier, um, I hate to say this, guys, but um, the baby boomer generation were brought up with innovation and really what's on offer today in terms of social care really isn't good enough for us. Baby boomer generation put a man on the moon. Yes. <laughs> Plus. And we haven't done that in our generation. <laughs> good point, Stuart. So, um, so yes, I, so I think the challenge remains. And if anybody has um, equally um, <clears throat> stereotypical um, adverts that they'd like us to highlight, please just hashtag D-E-U-K care and we'll pick them up on the next podcast. We'll Shirley let rip. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the next podcast, um, Stu and I will be discussing top tips for... Uh, from the Social Innovation Camp Meetup, which is exploring involving startups in social care. And there have already been some interesting questions about how to ensure the sustainability of startups in the care supply chain and how to recover research and development costs from Gary Haywood, who tweets as that gorilla. And as a as an entrepreneur in the social care field, I'm sure there's a lot of thoughts and ideas you have because it's tough. You know, it's a fragmented market. It's a confusing market. We have all these different funding streams and we desperately need innovation. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> We've been looking at crowdsourcing, um, crowdfunding schemes at the moment as well, among many other things. Oh, I, you know, and, and that, you know, I mean, maybe we also need to look at crowdfunding. But, but, but I mean, I think the other reality is that you've got all of these big funders like Nesta, Nominet Trust, Big Lottery Fund, putting a lot of money into innovation. But we still don't seem to have made the connection between innovators, developers and how we get commissioners to commission in different ways and new services. Yeah, I want some holistic process. I want some kind of person Absolutely. who's overseeing the whole thing yeah so i mean i think this obviously is an ongoing discussion but you know i'm very aware uh, of the challenges that you face 
um, as a as a social care entrepreneur. So um, so we're going to have a bit of a discussion about this next time round. Yeah. So so that that's me. What are you up to, Stuart? <laughs> well, I'm heading up to Scotland for my family for a week and a bit. Uh, my daughter starting school in September. That's one of these staggered start things, and she's in the last group. So we've got a bit of a childcare gap. Um, so we decided to have a wee holiday. Um, so we're going to stay with my dad for a few days. And as you know, he's minding you as a number one. Yep. Uh, he's been uh, my focus group of one uh, for a while <laughs> during the, the development. So I'll be quizzing him and see how he, see how he's getting on with the new design and the features. And I know his comments will probably just be more pictures of CJ, which is fine, his granddaughter. Um, in the middle of that, though, and it's talking about funding, I'm popping back to Guildford for a day. I literally trains and boats and planes for a half hour uh, presenting mindings to a selection committee uh, because mm. we've been getting support from the team at the Surrey Innovation Park, uh, part of Surrey University in mm-hmm. Guildford, um, where they spin out and spin in high-tech startups. Uh, and their entrepreneur in residence, uh, Ben Partridge, there, shout out to him, he's been a great help. And he's been whipping our business plan into shape and setting mindings up for presenting to the Surrey 100 Angel uh, Investment Network and the Set Square Partnership as well, which is a collaboration between the universities of Bath, Bristol, Exeter, Southampton and Surrey. And we're working towards hopefully presenting mindings at their investment showcase um, in London in October. Yeah, where the cream of, basically the cream of the companies that they're all mentoring get together in a very large auditorium full of angels and VCs, etc. And we are currently in the shortlist of 20. Uh, so fingers crossed we get down to the final eight where we get to present. Even if we don't, we'll get to be there, but mm-hmm. eight of them get to present. So my life as an extended episode of Dragon's Den continues. <laughs> is, is that going to be recorded? Uh, Your presentation? I, uh, I don't know. I would imagine something like that mm. that somebody will be recording. I might take along my video camera. Oh, I, th- I think we should case. see it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, good luck with Thank that. You. that Thank um, you. The, the, the ongoing ongoing story, Dragon's Den, funding and innovation for the future. Where do we get the connections going, Andrea? Something for social care <clears throat> leadership to consider, I think, quite seriously. And I think that one of the things that we've got to be thinking about is how do we take those bright ideas and turn them into um, evidence of the difference that they make because that's actually what people are looking for when they're commissioning services is that they're using resources cost effectively and and those people who are self-funders want to know that the way that they're spending their money is actually um, effective so I think there's a connection there in terms of how do you demonstrate that effect and actually present it in a way that makes sense to people who are making funding decisions for the future. And the great thing about digital, the great thing about social, the great thing about online is it's all measurable. It's so measurable down to the minutiae of um, when people are watching it, how much they're watching it, how, you know, literally how long people are looking at a web page, where about in the web page they're looking at, etc. That, that's so measurable. So in terms of that kind of um, seeing that it's working, it's all it's provable. Yes, yes. And in, in, in a way, dare I be slightly controversial here and say that um, we don't require those same outcomes and impacts for a lot of people who go into residential care at the moment, sadly. Well, and I think that that's one of the things that the white paper has been kind of promoting is looking at the outcomes um, and the framework around that and what are the things that we are measuring um, uh, because you know they may not necessarily be the right things. So, you know, we need to be thinking about that too. Mm. I, I, I foresee an interesting couple of years for social care. Oh, undoubtedly. <laughs> and I should say, um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, meeting our September guests on the podcast, Mel Findlater from the UCAN Hub and Paul Hodgkin, who's Chief Exec of Patient Opinion. So, special thanks to Andrea Sutcliffe, Chief Executive of Sky, who has been our guest on the podcast today. That's it from us this week. We hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. If you did enjoy it, please help spread the word. Tell your friends about us. Remember, you can follow me at Minding Stew. And you can follow me at Shirley Ayres. And you can follow me at Crouch and Tiger 7. And if you do tweet about the show, and please do, and tell your communities about us, remember to use the hashtag, hashtag DEUKCare. Until next time. Until next time. Thank you very much.